Meanwhile, if you got your Bibles, would you turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, the 27th chapter, and I'm reading from verse 50 to 51. If you don't have a Bible, we have graciously provided the scriptures for you. But if you're a person that loves to uh, take notes, you definitely need to get your Bible out and your notepads. And We are at a very important juncture today in the life of Jesus. Today is what we call Palm Sunday. Amen? Now, Palm Sunday, that's made up and in the sense that somebody came up with that name, Palm Sunday. Ash Wednesday, is that what they call it? And all these different things have been handed down to us, the church, by Catholicism. These are not things that, as New Testament believers, we don't hold on to these things. We hold on to Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. However, with saying that, we are very grateful for the reminder of Passover. Easter is also a pagan name. We are in the season of Passover for the Jews. We've already, the church has already passed over. Amen. We've already crossed the Jordan. We are in the promised land. So at this point in the juncture and the history of the church, we are reflecting on the story of Jesus and his life. But we are not mourning, nor do we have to worry about Good Friday and if we got to get fish. Jamaicans, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Guyanese, I'm talking to you. This is all nonsense. Eat meat. Enjoy life. We've, these events have already taken place. We have Passed over it already. Amen? Amen. Don't get caught up with all these religious things. It's a bunch of nonsense. We don't need to mourn. Get over it. Nudge your neighbor and say, get over it. Say, amen. 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 I wanted to throw that out before I read the scriptures to you. Here is what Matthew chapter 27, verse 50 and 51 says. Jesus passionately cried out, took his last breath, and gave up his spirit. At that moment, the veil in the, whole, in, in, in the Holy of Holies was torn in two from top to bottom. Amen? This week when I was reading... The Passover story. I started to weep when I came across. And this particular scripture jumped out at me. That's what we do as preachers. In, in these times. Christmas and Easter and so forth. We read the stories over and over. And we say hey God speak to us. So I was having an opportunity to, to kind of soak myself again. And in all that Jesus had done. And this scripture leaped at my heart. I began to weep, Pastor Pirelli. And by the way, thank you for last week. It was just awesome. I had a chance to see it and many others as well. And we are so grateful for your ministry here in the house. Amen? Amen. <laughs> this text does not stand alone. In fact, back in the Old Testament, when God was establishing himself to Israel as their God, they had just come out of Egypt. They had been in 400 years of bondage. They have lost track of God. 
Moses is in the wilderness with them. And God gave them instructions. God instructed Moses to make some veils, three in fact. And one of the veils was very specific and very powerful. One of the veils was to go into the temple that God told Moses to build. And it was to separate the holy place from the holies of holies. There are levels as we step into God's presence. The outer court, the inner court, the holy place, the holies of holies. And, and so God had told Moses, says, I need a veil to cover the holies of holies. So behind the veil was the Ark of Covenant of which God's presence would show up. Now, this is a very interesting concept because if you really think of the word veil and you begin to look it up in the Hebrew, the word veil in the Hebrew actually means separate. So what did God separate? God separated himself from mankind. But he wanted to be on the earth. He wanted his presence to be upon the earth. But, but no one was allowed to access him. In fact, in fact, if you jump on over to Leviticus chapter 16 verse 2, look at what it says. God had actually put a barrier between him and man. He shut man out. Look at what it says in Leviticus. And the Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he's not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place. He's not allowed to go. Nobody was allowed to go behind this veil where the presence of God was. In fact, for the instructions in Exodus chapter 30 tells us that God said to Moses when he established this veil that once a year, everybody say once a year, one priest, everybody say one priest, once a year, one priest was allowed to come behind the veil. Now that priest wasn't, couldn't just step in there. There was a ton of religious preparations he had to make. But once a year, one priest got to go and visit God's presence. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? Now everybody else was considered an outsider. There was only one inside man. And that was the high priest. Nobody else could go into the presence of God. No one else. No ordinary person like you or me could just, God, are you there? You couldn't peek behind that veil. You dropped dead. I figured if Satan was here and he tried to get there himself, he'd drop dead. But only one man was allowed to. And that was after much, much preparation. So I want to tell you why I was weeping. Because I began to thank God as I remember, as I remember this story. I began to thank God for Jesus. Because on that day when Jesus died on the cross, on that Good Friday, this could be my Good Friday message on Sunday. On that day Jesus died on the cross, a, a phenomenal event took place that a lot of people miss. The veil in the temple rented from top to bottom. Now you got to understand, this veil was no ordinary veil. It was made out of, out of skin. It was thick. It was heavy. It was wide. It was big. And it was torn from the top to the bottom. You see, if we were to tear a veil, nobody, or, or a drapery, nobody would tear the drapery from the top. We would tear it from the bottom. So, you know, theologians have said that it was God that tore the veil. Everybody say amen. He tore it from the top because that's where he is. Just makes sense. From the top to the bottom. My soul was overwhelmed as I read it because one man alone was allowed. One day a year, 
But now Jesus has torn the veil. And all of us are now allowed. Oh my goodness. That's why I was weeping. And see God, when the veil tore, God was saying to us, you are no longer an outsider. I don't want you to be on the outside anymore. I want you to come on in on the inside. God never wanted us to be on the outside. He wanted a relationship with us. He wanted us to know him, to move beyond the veil. So God, when the veil tore, I believe God was saying, come on in. Come in. I'm going to leave the door open for you. That's what I believe that veil represented. Now, we love, and, and, I, and I get it, we, we love celebrating the blood and, and, and the cross and all these things. But very few people talk about the veil. You see, the, behind the veil was what? The presence of God. And when the veil was torn, it meant that we can now have access to the presence of God. In fact, in fact, Jesus, and let me put this as a pun, Jesus unveiled the presence of God. That's what he did. He did what? Unveil the presence of God. That's a very important point in scripture. I get it, the blood is important. I get it, the cross is important. I get it, the garden of Gethsemane is important. I get it, Palm Sunday is important. But I want to tell you something that is of equal importance. The presence of God was unveiled. Everybody say the presence of God was unveiled. It's a very important part of Easter. Easter is not just about chocolates. At Easter, the presence of God was unveiled. Jesus died, but the presence of God was unveiled. The tearing of his flesh was equal to the tearing of the veil. Listen, very important scripture. Very important scripture. For the first time, Access to God's presence was given. Amen. Can I tell you the end result of all this thing we call religion? And I'm not religious at all. <laughs> Trust me, I hate religion. The end result of all that we're doing here is to be in the what good is heaven, and I shared this with you a while back. What good is heaven without the presence of God? And that's not heaven. We got gold, they got gold. We got pearls, maybe not as much as they got, but we got them. What good is heaven? The whole end result of all this is the presence of God. The blood, the cross, the grave, everything. It's all about presence of God. Don't ever forget why you're doing what you're doing. You're not doing what you're doing to go to heaven. You're doing what you're doing to be in the... That's the ultimate goal of the church. That's why we gather here every Sunday. That, this is it. This is it. There is, this is the end result. Don't forget why we're doing what we're doing. Do you think I like waking up at 6 o'clock on Sunday mornings? <laughs> I'm sorry, not me. I'll leave that for the Trinidadians. <laughs> but not me. But I'll tell you why I would wake up. For the presence of God. The presence of God is why I do what I do. Jump on over to Psalm 16, verse 11 for a minute. Let me show you what's so powerful about the presence of God. Check this out. So powerful. I'm going to make it simple for you today. This is Easter unpacked. You make known to me the path of life. In, the, in, your, in his presence, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Now imagine with me, and let me take you back to the Old Testament. This is in the Old Testament, but this is David speaking. In the Old Testament, nobody got to see the presence of God. But yet in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. I guess these were the most miserable people on the planet. 
Because one man got to go to the presence of God once a year. Yet in the presence of God there is but one man alone? Come on, man. In the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. But yet only one was allowed to access that pleasure. One was allowed to access that fullness. One was allowed to access those treasures. This is why you need to thank God the veil was torn. Because of this scripture. The veil was th torn so that we can have fullness of joy. Somebody say amen. Oh boy. In his presence there is what? Do, do you know that no person or possession that you have can give you joy? Do you know that? <laughs> Listen, my wife told me this week. She said, she says, happiness Is what the world gets. Joy is what the church gets. Watch this. Happiness is circumstantial, she said. In fact, I think happiness is overrated. Hold on. Stay with me. For the joy set before him, the scripture says, he what? He endured the cross. He didn't say he was happy. He said he had joy knowing he was going to the cross. Now, a lot of you folks, a lot of folks, they're looking for happiness. And, and, and happiness is circumstantial in the sense that happiness comes when you have things or people in your life. You need things to make you happy. You need phone calls and a back rub and money and cars and houses. Those things make you happy. And, and guess what? When those things are taken from you, boo-hoo. When your car breaks down, when you got to pay that expensive bill, boo-hoo. You're not happy anymore. When your kids misbehave, you're not happy anymore. When your health goes awry, you're not happy anymore. Happiness is circumstantial. Happiness comes based on what you have, your perception. You're in a good marriage and the marriage goes sour, you're unhappy because you're living for happiness. The church don't live for happiness. Jesus never lived his life for happiness. He lived his life for joy. Hold on, I'm teaching you something. Stay with me because I hear this, 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 oh, I'm not happy with that, Pastor. Get over it. We all want happiness. Oh, they don't make me happy. That church is not a happy church. We don't want you to be happy. I want you to go deeper than happiness. Now, you should be happy. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> when, you, when, you <laughs> when you have plenty, you're happy. When you have nothing, you are Unhappy. You can get unhappy with anything. Did you know that? You can get unhappy with anything. You can get unhappy with good things in your life. You know, some people say, well, if I get a bigger house, I'm going to be happy. Until you got to clean the thing. Until you got to pay the mortgage. Then a lot of people went buying houses and oh, I want a big house. And then all of a sudden you're hearing them, oh, it's too expensive, Pastor. They were happy when they bought it. But now the happiness is gone because of the bills. Check me, wait for me, I'm coming to you. So you, you wanted to be happy. Is that what you wanted? I wanted that fancy car until you got to pay for repairs. And then all of a sudden you start coming, like, oh, you know, to do my breaks, $1,200. Could have paid a mortgage with that. 1200 bucks. Think, hold on, think with me for a minute. See, happiness is a very misleading concept. Did, did you hear what I said? Happiness is a very misleading concept. 
People yield to their flesh because they want to be happy. For a moment, it lasts. Happiness, very misleading. I, this is the narrative of our day, happiness. Everybody wants to be happy. If I go on vacation, I'm going to be happy. And when you come back, you're miserable because the flight was too long. And, oh, I got to go back to work. There goes your happiness. But you just came from vacation. You spent $1,000. Well, that's not a lie. I don't even know how much you spent these days. I think a vacation to Jamaica is, what, 1800 bucks. More than that, good God bless you. I hope you tied that much. <laughs> Listen, happiness is overrated, man. Happiness is what? Overrated. Listen, when, when you don't, watch this. <laughs> when, when you don't have money, you're unhappy. Everybody say amen. When you got money, you're unhappy. Because you got to spend it. Say amen. <laughs> Now all of a sudden you got a whole bunch of money. You got a couple grand in your, in your account and, and then the bills come in and you got to spend the money that you save. You're unhappy. You are the hardest people to please because you're going after happiness. Did you, did you ever find a scripture in the Bible that says happiness? It's misinterpreted. <laughs> happiness is circumstantial. Listen, I, I don't know if you've ever seen it. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Have you ever heard or seen wealthy people commit suicide? Why? Because they're unhappy. But how can you be unhappy with money? I mean, you, got, you can buy and sell all of us. How can you be unhappy with money? So if you think the pursuit of money will bring you happiness, you're highly mistaken. If you think the pursuit of, of greater wealth or houses or cars or vacations and these things, I'll tell you, and I don't want Dr. Pirelli to speak because I'm sure he can tell you stories of the unhappiness of money. We have this generation that is warped. They don't know the Bible, so they, they go after happiness. I want to be happy. I want that girl. She's going to make me happy until she wakes up. <laughs> until she opens her mouth <laughs> my God there's a lot of people out there who have money and they have things and they're depressed they're not happy I know a lot of wealthy people that are depressed they're sick they're not happy but you got everything how is that possible there's a lot of unhappy people out there my friend and some have everything Somebody say joy is better. Somebody say joy is better. Do you want to know what joy is? In the presence of God there is not happiness. <laughs> this is a very powerful scripture for your brain. What is joy? Does anybody know what joy is? Joy is a very, very definitive word. It's a very scary word. Very, very scary word. Without getting technical, this is what joy is. Are you ready? Joy is the knowledge of knowing everything is going to be okay. <laughs> write it down, write it down. What is joy? Come on, everybody. Not your neighbor and say everything is going to be okay. That's joy. That's the foundation of joy. It's not about what you have. It's the fact that you've settled it. Everything is going to be okay. Oh, man, I feel the anointing. I feel like dancing on that. That's, that's, that's why the Bible says, watch this. That's why the Bible says joy is found in the presence of God. Because when you're in the presence of God, you get the message, everything. There's a song. See, that's where joy comes from. Joy doesn't come from possession. Joy comes from knowing everything's going to be okay. That's where joy comes from. That's why you wake up and you smile. That's why a man in prison can have joy. That's why a person with cancer can have joy. That's why a person who's in debt can have joy. Because they have a revelation. Everything is going to be okay. That's the source of joy. You're going to be getting married soon. 
Say with me, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. I hope. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. So the Bible says, watch this. The Bible says, in the presence of God, there is the fullness. In other words, your whole life will be, will be taken over by this thought. Everything is going to be okay. It don't matter come hell or high water, everything is going to be okay. Everybody say, everything's going to be okay. Now you got joy. That's joy. It's a simple equation, but most people don't know it. What we're looking for is we're looking for happiness. See, I'm not looking for the possession of it. I thank God for the possession of wealth. I thank God for the possession of food and shelter and all these things. But I'll tell you what I have inside of me. Everything. So, so guess what? Jesus is going to the cross. He's going to the cross. Everybody said Jesus is going to the cross. And here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he did what? He endured the cross. In other words, he looks at the cross. He looks at Pilate. He looks at the soldier. He looks at the whip. He looks at the devil and he says, and the Bible says, he had joy because he knows everything. See, see, when they put you under pressure, when they begin to beat you up, when they begin to slaughter you, you have to have some joy. In this world, we don't need happiness. We need joy. I said we need joy. Joy. When they kick you out on the street, when they rob you, when they beat you up, when they curse you down, you got to say, I got joy. Joy, 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 joy. I got joy down in my soul. Everything is going to be all right. Understand the power of joy. And where is it found? In the presence of God. That makes the presence of God vitally important. Point in case. The veil being torn in the temple was to release the presence of God. That says, everything is going to be okay. It's going to be all right. You see, a lot of these Christian religious people, they plead the blood. Oh, I plead the blood. I plead the blood. I do this. I do that. And they're, they suck. <laughs> they're the most depressing, unhappy people you'll ever see. Why? Because they don't have the hope everything is going to be all right. So when I look at the cross, listen, have you, let me give you this imagery. Have you ever seen those cross and it has like a purple sheet across it or something wrapped around it? You know what that sheet is? That's the veil. The cross and the veil works together. So you're looking on the outside and everybody's looking at the cross. You're looking at Jesus is going to pay for our sins. The blood will be shed. But every, there's a lot of us who forgot what was happening in the temple. In the temple, God was sending the message, everything is going to be all right. That's the message in the temple. It's part of our Easter story. Don't remove the temple from Easter. Because we get access to his presence. And in his presence, fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Amen? Amen. Turn with me to Acts chapter 3 verse 19. I want to teach you something this morning. I want to... I was... I was Rereading this Easter story, and I said, God, we've missed a lot of stuff here, man. We've missed a lot of stuff. I'm so thankful that you guys pay me to stay home. I'm so thankful. <laughs> I'm so thankful. Look at this. This is the cross. So the disciples, they're preaching the cross. They're going to preach something very powerful. They're going to preach the cross, and they're going to preach the temple. Look at what they say. Repent. Everybody say, that's the cross. Everybody say, that's the cross. Repent of your sins. He says, 
Repent therefore and be converted. That's the power of the cross. That your sins may be blotted out. If you're born again and your sins are blotted out, that's fantastic. But have you ever seen born again people miserable as hell? I've seen them. Their life suck. Their whole life is a mess. They're carrying on. And, and they tell you, oh, I'm born again. I'm going to heaven. You're going to heaven a miserable punk. I said it. So repent, therefore, and be converted so that your sins may be blotted out. And then he gives you another so. This is where we get the idea, so and so. <laughs> he said, so that your sins will be. Because, and then he says, so that times of refreshing might come from. Did you see it? So we're now saved. We're going to heaven. But there's more than just a ticket to heaven. There are times of refreshing. Do you feel refreshed this morning, brother? I bet you do. I get refreshed by watching all of you. <laughs> there are times of refreshing. The child of God is not only to spend time praying about your sins. Oh, God, help my sins. Give me strength to overcome lying and cussing and cheating. The child of God is not only supposed to spend time Praying and talking to the Father. The child of God is supposed to spend time cultivating the presence of God in their life. Everybody say cultivate the presence. Everybody say cultivate the presence. Why? Because in the presence of God, there are times of refreshing. It's like going to an artesian well and drinking the water and bathing in it. There's times of refreshing. It's like having a nice nap and waking up. I feel refreshed. It's like having a coffee. I'll leave that there. <laughs> times of refreshing. Why does the Bible want us to have times of refreshing? Because you get miserable. Some of you get sucky. Have you ever been around a Christian in a while? My wife, Christine, do I get sucky? Amen, sister. Thank you. Hallelujah. She's an honest woman. Maybe too honest, but anyways. <laughs> I get sucky. Pastor Tony is the suckiest. I can tell when he hasn't been in the presence. The roads, God holds, Thomas. The rice is too hard. Amen, Thomas. We've traveled with him. And Thomas and I are like, we need to get this guy into prayer. <laughs> he needs to be refreshed. You see, when you're not refreshed, you start complaining. When you're not refreshed, your faith dies. When you're not refreshed, your, your, ex, your anxiety goes up. And, your, and, your, and your, your, your love for things and God goes down. This is why refreshment is so important. Sometimes we serve refreshments at church. And why do we do that? Because your energy is down. You're, you're sucky. Sucky baby. So, so the Bible is saying here, and watch me this morning. The Bible is saying that this, 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 this presence is important for you Christians. Because you get sucky. You get, you get overwhelming all of a sudden. You lose track of how good God is. You lose track of your faith. You lose track of the church. Oh, it's too far. But it wasn't too far when you were sick. Oh boy, it's going to get hot now. So you need times of refreshing. It wasn't, it wasn't too far when your kid needed prayer. But no, no. Who told you to move so far, by the way? I'm just saying. Do you understand where I'm going this morning? We need times of refreshing. I've seen when the presence of God touches people what it does. It revives them. It re-empowers them. It frees them from the murmuring and complaining. Some of you are murmuring too much. There's a refreshing that is needed in the house. Everybody say amen. It's one thing to get saved. It's another thing to lose your vibrancy. Oh my. Remember when, when you first got saved? Hallelujah! We couldn't stop your hallelujahs. We, we couldn't stop you from coming to church. We couldn't stop you from giving. Oh, you were giving gold rings and diamond necklaces. And now to even get you to give $10, we got to beg you. We need to get you refreshed so you can open your wallet. Amen. 
You see, when you're refreshed, when you're vibrant, when, you're, when you feel like a new man, you will do things that you, you, you can't do, that you used to do, per se. That's why I love young Christians, because they come in and they're fresh for a couple of months until some old fart get a hold of them, mess their life up. I love hanging out with the young people. That's, it's because some of you, you murmur too much. My God, I'm just saying. Vibrancy needs to come back to the church. And excitement for life and godliness needs to come back to the church. But it only comes when we are in the... When you don't go to the presence, you come and you say your hallelujahs and your amens and you shout. And as soon as you leave the church, you complain. Because you're not a presence person. <coughs> Believers these days are not vibrant anymore. Life is full of mess for many. Many are critical and depressed. When you talk to them, you don't want to stay there too long. You want to run. Have you ever been around certain people like that? You can't talk to them. They want to talk about Bitcoin. I don't want to hear about Bitcoin. <laughs> they want to talk about their dog. Keep the dog to yourself, man. It's your dog. You buy out him. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's refresh it. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. In other words, people who are refreshed can impart refreshment into others. People who are vibrant can get others vibrant. And that's why I don't like a dead church. I'd quit if you all died. Just saying. <laughs> spiritually, of course, spiritually. <laughs> I'm a vibrant guy. I love to yell. Get over it. Uncle Ray, he yelled at me all my life, so now I'm yelling. Transferred it. Blame Uncle Ray. <laughs> Nothing wrong with yelling, being loud. I love being loud. I was telling my boys the other day, Dr. Pirelli, I go, don't worry. If you speak loud, it's part of our heritage. <laughs> None of them speak loud. They speak like their mom. Took the wrong heritage. <laughs> Listen to me this morning. We need refreshing again and again. Everybody say, we need refreshing again and again. It's like sleeping, man. You need to sleep and wake up and refresh. You, don't, you can't just refresh one time. Oh, pastor, I don't want to come to the altar. You don't realize that alone tells you you need refreshing. Amen. That alone tells you you have a problem. Every time you sit there, you go, he's talking to you, you know. <laughs> You need refreshing. The moment you start blaming your wife, the moment you start blaming your wife and say, look, it's because of you I'm in this mess. You need refreshing on a box. <laughs> Listen to me carefully. You got to take responsibility for your misery. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That's what my wife told me. She goes, you need a nap. <laughs> In other words, you need some refreshment. Carlton, take responsibility for your misery. <laughs> Listen, I've never, met an, I've never met a man that doesn't get miserable. I've never met one. Do you have one? Linda? Thank you for not answering. <laughs> I've never met a man that's not miserable. They're all cute and nice at night, and in the morning they're miserable as hell. <laughs> Everybody, listen, we all get miserable. And so the scriptures put it there. It says, you believers, you who repent and are born again, converted, you need to have times of refreshing in the presence of God. This is why we cultivate the presence of God here. Because I know the importance of the presence of God. It was part of the Easter story. And why should it be removed from the church? We have the cross in the church. We have the blood in the church. We got Jesus in the church. We got, listen, we got angels in the church why can't we have an open heaven amen why can't we have the presence of God in the church times of refreshing amen somebody amen we need to get stirred up again and you need to stay stirred up for the things of God we need to have continual exposure to the presence of God not just come one day in the presence of God and then you're gone for 10 months until you need your next fix that's what somebody, you need to have continual encounters with the presence of God. Can I tell you why? Number one, you are, you are a spirit being. 
and your spirit thrives in the presence of God. Number two, because you are constantly bombarded on all sides daily, you need to be exposed to the presence of God so that the hand of the enemy can be removed from you. If not, some of you are to commit murder already. I know I would have. Amen. I'll leave it there. See, God knows that many of us get worn out. We get tired. We get beat up. Some of us have even yielded to the devil on purpose. Because we can't control our emotions and we cuss and we drink too much and we smoke too much and, and everything becomes too much and then all the police is involved. Don't you know stories like that? I do. Thank you, Vanessa. I see your hand. <laughs> She's over beside me. I do pass off. We get beat up. And, and, and I want to I re reintroduce you to something awesome this morning. Every one of us go through stuff. Every one of us daily, weekly. I don't know what frustrates your grace. But that's what the presence of God does. It heals. It nurtures. It, it soothes. It, it removes. It strengthens. It invigorates. It, it, it makes us vibrant again. It lifts our faith again. I'm telling you, this is what the presence of God does. My, my mom... She watches the broadcast, uh, I guess, online now. <laughs> and uh, she would call sometimes to tell me a lot of things. She's probably watching now, trying to tell me something. <laughs> I thank God she can't text. <laughs> because I would have got a text right now. If you're watching, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> I would have got a text. Why are you talking about me? <laughs> But let me tell you something interesting that my mom called me this week. So she called me. She was watching you, by the way. Yeah, she likes you. It's okay, you're safe. <laughs> she called me. She said, look, I, I want to help with the building fund and so, so forth. I'm like, okay. I, I can't convince her. Apparently, Dr. Pirelli convinced her. You know, like, like, I mean, what good is your son? <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> um, but, but. Then she says to me, she says, she calls me by my nickname, which I won't tell you. Because she's not being a mother. And, and, and you, know what she, you know what mothers do, right? They try to control the phone, over the, the church over the phone. She says, listen, there are two songs you should play every week. <laughs> she thinks I'm running the church. <laughs> she says, listen, there are two songs you should, don't ever stop playing these songs. And always play them at the end. <laughs> All right, this, is what she, this is what she calls to tell me. She's watching. She's probably sitting there laughing. <laughs> and always play them at the end. So I said, I called Christine, the music director. I said, hey, music director, your mother-in-law says these two songs you need to play. <laughs> right? But let me tell you why she said it and what is happening. You see, I realize that my mother, through this broadcast, she's being ministered to by worship here in this house. And the presence that's in this house is causing my mother to cry. So she calls me to tell me, keep playing this song so I can keep crying. I don't know. That's my, anyways, that's my take on it. That's my take on it. <laughs> and you know what? Why not? Why not expose people to the presence of God? Why not? Why not? You know, there's a lot of, lot of preaching and a lot of teaching and everybody's got Bibles. But do you notice that even though you have two, three, one Bible, I'm not sure how many Bibles you got, but I got a few. The Bible there doesn't do anything for you unless you read it. But there's something about when you put on that worship song. Oh, my God. <laughs> There's just something like, I, I can't explain it, but goosebumps come, man. And like, you just want to go, oh, God, God. Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah the prophet. Uzziah the king dies. And Isaiah the prophet goes to the presence of God. And you know what he said? He said, oh, God, I'm unclean. When I see, see, you know, you don't have to preach to people to repent. 
Oh boy, here we go. We don't have to preach to people to repent. When they're in that presence, they will recognize their sinfulness. It happened to Isaiah. He says, he says, woe is me. A man of unclean lips, he realized that he, in the pre nobody preached to him. He just saw the glory of God fill the house like a train. And in that presence, sin was exposed. And he bended his knees and cried out, oh God. And the Bible says an angel came with a coal and touches uncleanness. Woe is me. What did it? Everybody say the presence of God. We don't need to preach down to people. Did you hear what I said? We don't need to do it. It's not, it doesn't make sense. I'm telling you, there's a greater tool, Brandon. There's a greater tool in the kingdom of God than just preaching, ah, you sinner, you're this, you stop it. When they come to your house, Lisa, put on some worship music. I'm sure Linda will be all over the crown crying, you know. You don't have to say nothing. Somebody say the presence of God brings times of refreshing. We have to constantly be in the presence. You're struggling with sin. You need the presence. You don't need another bully to preach down to you. Did you hear what I said? I don't want to be your bully. Those days are done for me. I'm quiet now. I'm a lamb. Amen. I'm just joking. Don't worry. Calm down. It hasn't happened fully yet. But one day, hallelujah, when I get to heaven. Anyways, <laughs> we don't need to beat you up. I think if we introduce people to the presence of God, they'll be like Isaiah. They'll just fall in his presence and the holiness of God. They will see their uncleanness and know that there is only one good and righteous Jesus. Amen? Amen. What does the presence of God do? It reveals sin. It allows us to give up things that we struggle with. You might be struggling with sin and some things in your life. And when you're in that presence, it'll cause you to yield fast like this. Have you, you know how many of you, your wives talk to you, men. Your wives talk to you, they talk to you, they talk to you. Listen, ladies, do me a favor. Bring them to church. It's done. It's done. Have you ever seen your husband cry on the ground before? Never. But what did he experience? Not me. The presence of God. You want to fix him? I'm telling you right now. <laughs> sorry, brother. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, there's something, listen, there's just something about that presence. I can't explain it. I know how it works. When you're in the presence of God, you get revelation. You see things you've never seen or heard. When you're in the presence of God, healings happen. Uh, you know how many people just being in the presence have been healed here? There was a woman one time, she had a pain for, I don't know, 30 years in her back. Ooh, and one day she's just sitting there, she felt a, a heat came. She was sitting in the pew, a heat came on her back. Boom, instantly healed in the presence of God. Tell me you're going to miss church. Go ahead. Watch it. And then there was, a, where's that gal? Where's that gal, Harriet? She was, she was behind the camera right there where Delroy is behind the camera. And she was doing exactly what Delroy was doing. And she had glasses just like yours, Delroy. And while she was looking through the lens, like you're looking through the lens right now, her eyes just got healed. She sort of flipped her glasses up and down. She said, oh, my God. A little Australian girl got healed by using, by being on the camera. Why? Not, not, nobody touched her. What did it? Who did it? The presence of God. It is so important that you bring the boy into the presence of God. When, when Hannah had a child, she made a vow. I'll send him to the house of the Lord. Why? Because she didn't want him to die. Listen carefully. You think church is a joke? It's not. Being in the presence of God is highly important. There's only so much you can get from worship music. But you actually need a tangible presence. And, they, and, and oh, by the way, when there's corporate worship, there's a heavier presence. Talk to me, somebody. Talk to me. Talk to me. Listen, in the presence of God, there is fullness. There is what? The fullness of joy and what? Pleasures. What are pleasures? Blessings. What do you get pleasure from? Blessings. There are blessings forevermore. Where is it found? presence of God. Everybody said the veil is important. The tearing of the veil is important. I'm bringing you home now. I'm bringing you home. <sighs> King David. 
I love it. The book of Psalms. He cried out one day. He said, Lord, take not thy presence, thy Holy Spirit. He acquainted the Holy Spirit with the presence. So he says, take not thy presence from me, God. He said these words. He said, I'd rather be a doorman in the house of the Lord. You know why? Because he was going to be close to the presence of God. We're in the house of the Lord. Because that's where the presence of God is most tangible. Yes, the presence of God is in your house. Don't get me wrong. He's in my house. But he's always in his house. Did you hear what I said? He's always in his house. So David cried out. Now David was a very very peculiar man from a very young age David had known the presence of God one of few men in the Bible that knew the presence of God and when David knew the presence of God a, a certain boldness came upon him he was always on fire the man talked like he was the most dangerous POW around he was in a system that hated him but he was powerful he might have been a prisoner in his own home, but he knew the presence of God, which made him powerful. When that boy talk, when that 16-year-old boy talk, you'd swear it was God speaking. Show me that uncircumcised Philistine. I'll, I'll leave it there. He, he talked with, he talked with, how does a 16-year-old talk like that? you got to know the presence of God is with you, Paul. Oh, Paul, now we're figuring it out now. This is the Holy Ghost. I didn't plan this. <laughs> presence of God. David was fat talking. But he really wasn't fat talking. It was God talking. <laughs> Everybody say God talk. Why? Because he was revitalized. The Bible said that when Saul had a spirit, David would come on over. Saul was being tormented. He had depression and all this nonsense. And David would come over. The presence of God would come and Saul would feel vitalized. He would be revived. Yet he was in depression. You see all these people that are experiencing depression? It's because you spend too much time watching Netflix. No presence on Netflix. Just saying. Hear me here today. David didn't need to go and ask God, God, what shall I do for you? Have you ever seen those kind of Christians? Anytime you tell me you don't know what to do with your life, I know you're not a presence person. Oh boy. Pastor, I need to know the will of God. Can I tell you something real stupid? You don't need to know the will of God. You need to know the presence of God. When you know the presence of God, when you are in the presence, you will know what to do. You, you got to hear me. The problem, the reason why you don't know what to do and why you got to buy your degree and do all this nonsense. But listen, there's such foolishness happening in the kingdom of God right now. It's blowing my mind. There are people out there paying to do missionary work. You don't have to pay to do mission. Pay to win souls, but pay to do missionary work. Are you mad? They've been so deceived and so fooled, it blows my mind. Listen to me carefully. David spent his life in the presence of God. From a child, I don't know, the Bible says, you know, his, his mother slept with his father, but his mother really wasn't the wife of the father. So they kicked the boy out. His mother was a little redhead gal. And so he had red head, red hair. He was, he was the ostrich amongst chicken he stood out he said my mother conceived me in sin his mother slept with the man or the man slept with, with the mother and bore the boy he wasn't even he was a legitimate son but from another woman not the wife that's why they kicked him out in the backyard go tend the sheep but while he was kicked out he 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 began to search out for a real father and he found god my, he said, my mother and my father did what? Forsook me. And the Lord took me up. That's what the scripture, he wrote it. His daddy kicked him out. His daddy, his daddy wasn't his real, it was his real daddy by birth. You know, all these half-breed fathers. 
They breed them and leave them to, leave them to die. You know, daddy, you're just a sperm donor. You don't understand what a daddy is yet. People don't know what a daddy is. So David found a daddy in the desert. <laughs> Where did David found his daddy? In the desert. He started to call on the name of the Lord. And he began to worship this God. And as he began to worship him and worship him and worship him, this presence came upon him and this presence made David bold like a lion. So a lion came and David says, oh yeah, you think you got power, let me show you. And the Bible says David ripped the lion apart with the presence. The Bible says a bear came after David and David looked at the bear and said, oh yeah, you think you, you don't know what I got with me. I got God with me and no matter what comes my way, I will destroy. He ripped the bear apart. He saw Goliath, he says, you uncircumcised Philistine. Who do you think you are? Because you're big, you can't fall. You can't fall, you're going to fall harder. David went after the enemy. Somebody said David went after the enemy. Point in case. When you're in the presence of God, you will know what to do. And your first assignment is go after the enemy. Put the mic there. See, what the problem is, because you lack presence, you become afraid. Because you lack presence, you're not bold anymore. Because you lack presence, you no longer feel that you're qualified. But the unqualified child was qualified by the presence of God. And you too can be qualified by the unction of God upon your life. Tony and I both couldn't read and write. We both had no, I couldn't read and write at 27 years old. I couldn't read and write properly. But when that presence came upon me, I'm sorry. I started to buy books. <laughs> I started to go to the nations and preach the gospel. Why? Because I, I didn't need an education. I needed presence. And check this out. The presence gives you the assignment. What is the assignment? Destroy the works of the devil. Anybody with the presence of God on their life, your assignment is to destroy the work of God. Do not call me and say, Pastor, what should I do? Get in the presence of God and you will know. You will know what to do. Stop telling me, but I don't know what, what God is calling me to. The first thing God calls you to do is come in. Everybody say, come in. Come in where? Beyond the veil. He opened it so you can come there first. Jesus even said these words. He says, wait here in Jerusalem. The book of Acts, chapter 2. Wait here in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. Then go get them. The first place we need to be is in the presence of God. Before you respond to an email, go into the presence of God. Before, before you, you do anything in your day, go into the presence. Wake up in the morning, bow your knees at your bed and just say, oh God, in your presence is fullness of joy and all the blessings, all the pleasures I'll ever need today. You are my source in the presence of God, Simeon. I'm done. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. The presence of God will always take weak men and weak women and turn them into warriors. I know some of you don't like preachers like me. That's okay. One day, you will be like me if you go to the presence of God. There's something about the presence. The presence of God takes boldness and sets it on fire. <laughs> so if you thought I was bold when I was, when I was a gangster, I'm much more bold now. Oh, yeah. Trust me, I, I, we, we talk about this all the time at home. When I, when I would run the streets and fighting and all this, now nah, I was bold. We were bold. But when that presence of God came upon me, I had a different level of boldness that I could not imagine. I don't care what demons look like. I will go into the camps of demons. I, you know, uh, my brother sent me a video, and let me end with this. My brother sent me a video in my country, Guyana, 
I've been praying and said, God, when do I need to go home? When do I need to go home? And my brother sent me a video this week, and I was watching the video in an area called New Amsterdam, a regular high school. Twelve kids just manifested in class. Start screaming, foaming at the mouth. In school, in a public school, all over the news, the whole entire country saw it on the news. And then the Holy Spirit says, go home. Time to go home. It's like, oh, my assignment. God gave me Guyana. And you don't understand that. You'll hear about it soon. Time to go home. Why? Because we've cultivated the presence of God. We are no longer afraid, Tony. We have one more last hurrah before the rapture. Let's go get a nation. One last hurrah. The presence of God can do anything. Would you stand with me all over this place and let's get into the presence of God for a minute. Simeon, that song my mother likes. <laughs> That's going to be my cue now to Simeon. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what you cannot fix and what you can't overcome and what, you, what pills and doctors and medicine can't cure, the presence of God can do all that. You have to learn how to spend time beyond the veil. Everybody say beyond the veil now. It's time we move beyond Good Friday. Amen? Uh, did you hear what I said? It's time we move beyond the veil. It's time. Please, I need you to move beyond the veil and stop whining. Please. Get into the presence of God and speak like a, like a child of God does. Would you close your eyes all over this place? And whatever you're going through today, say, hey, God, I got no solutions, but you do. You are my creator, the lover of my soul. <laughs> Turn it up, man. Turn it up. Don't be afraid. Pump the bass in this place. Close your eyes. Put your hands in front of you. Let the presence come upon you. Spend this week going into the presence of God. Take a minute. Just takes a minute to get in. When you get in, you won't want to come out. Don't go there thinking you're going to pray for five hours. You're not. Go there saying, God, I just want to be in your presence. And five hours later, you will say, wow. That's the secret of prayer. We here at KICC, we are on a mission to cultivate the presence of God for anyone that comes here so they can get to know His presence, not us. It's not about me. It's about Him. We want you to know the presence of God. Holy Spirit, have your way this morning.